Hi everyone. Again, if you've just joined us, um, welcome to Sustainable House Day 2020. Um, uh, we're going to get started in a minute with uh, the crew from Live at the Cape. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Clint in a second. Um, just to remind people, this is one of three rooms for the day. Um, there's lots of different sessions, 30 Q&A panel sessions over the course of the day, looking at different projects in different homes across Australia. Um, so if you're keen to check out some of those uh, other ones during the day, head back to the Sustainable House Day website under the programs area. Um, but for the moment, um, we're going to have a session on sustainable house design and construction. And I'm going to hand over to Clint here from the Cape. Thanks, guys. Hello and welcome everybody. I see uh, quite a few people have joined us. Uh, the numbers are really starting to soar as we just ticked over to 10 o'clock. Uh, so this session is on sustainable design and construction. We're focusing on the Eco Village Live at the Cape or The Cape. My name's Clint Hare. Uh, I'm the general manager of The Cape and I'm very privileged to be speaking with you all today. But before I begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, especially as we're talking about living sustainably. Uh, so in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. So a, a quick summary of the Cape for those who aren't too familiar. Uh, it's located just under two hours southeast of Melbourne and there's a 230 lot estate, which we're about halfway through. Um, the, um, the, it is the brainchild of Brendan Condon uh, and, uh, and a few other ethical investors um, after working with on revegetation projects for some time um, with other large developers. We've realized that the, the quality of the estates and the, the housing product wasn't quite up to standard. Um, so Brendan took it upon himself and teamed up with the other ethical investors to develop uh, the first carbon neutral net zero carbon estate at scale. So um, that's a little bit about the Cape and we'll talk a bit more about features of the Cape um, in time. I'm just seeing um, some issues with the audio here. So I will um, do what I can about that. Um, initially, however, I um, just want to talk about each of the panelists. Firstly, we have Adam Dietrich. Adam's a multi-award winning architect uh, and director of Adam Dietrich Architects based in Melbourne. Adam has over 20 years experience working in residential and commercial architecture with a passion for delivering intelligent architecture that's environmentally and socially sustainable. Adam's part of the team behind the Cape uh, at development at Cape Patterson, which won the Victorian Premier Sustainable uh, Sustainability Design Award in 2012. Um, and Adam's enjoyed being part of the Cape project team as the design review panel and seeing it evolve from concept to the truly unique development and thriving community that it is today. Glad to hear the work. The audio is working a bit better now. Thank you. Um, Adam also loves bushworking and uh, cross country skiing. And uh, our second panelist uh, in no particular order is Tony O'Connell. Um, so Tony, his desire to deliver an exceptional result for clients uh, in all aspects of what can do um, in all aspects of construction is what drives him. He's a director of TS Constructions, who were based down near the Cape in Wonthaggy. Tony commenced his construction career at a local volume builder, where he learned the basics of delivering projects on time and on budget. But uh, seeking greater challenges in the year 2000, he accepted a part, um, he joined TS Constructions, and then he accepted a partnership in 2016. Uh, he's a qualified MBA Green Living Builder, and has a, uh, completed a certificate four in building and construction, environmental management, and a diploma of building and construction. Um, so Tony has the ability to take uh, an initial concept from a client, and I've seen it quite a few times, and develop it into a construction project that runs seamlessly from start to finish. Uh, his knowledge of practical sustainability initiatives mean that he can find solutions that are cost effective and provide long-term benefits with minimum minimal environmental impact. Tony's other interests involve um, park run, uh, which is a free weekly volunteer led 5k walk or run, as well as ultra marathon running, uh, competing in trail races of up to 100 kilometres. Uh, he's also a life member of the Wonthaggy CFA, a life member of the Cape Patterson Surf Life Saving Club. Uh, and Michelle. Uh, Michelle is a trained, trained as a journalist in public policy and law. Uh, Michelle's worked to build sustainable communities, organisations and cities. 
And she knows a bit about sustainable affording, affordable housing through her advocacy and social entrepreneurial pursuits. She moved to the Cape, to the Cape in Cape Patterson in early 2019 with her partner, Nathan, and the two young children. And in addition to all of this, uh, Michelle's kept very busy by her five-year-old as he tears down to the beach with his boogie board in hand. And she also loves kayaking. So just to, to kick things off, like I say, please feel free to click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen uh, as questions come to mind. Um, but firstly, I might uh, ask Adam, so you've master planned uh, various successful and thriving communities, uh, estates and villages like the Cape. In your opinion, what are the key aspects of the Cape's estate design which make it special? And your audio, you might just have to tick the audio on there, Adam. Thank you, Clint. Can you hear me now, I hope? Yeah, yeah we can hear you well. Uh, great question. And so where do I start? The Cape is so different from other developments in so many good ways. Um, I could start with the location, but uh, Tony and uh, Michelle would be better at talking about that, seeing they lived the dream down there. Um, but seriously, there's a lot of things to think about here. I think from the starting point, many, you know, quite a few years ago, 10 or more years ago, when the Cape got serious about doing the research about how to create a sustainable community. So this is not your typical subdivision. This is starting with how do we get this to work? How do we get it to be sustainable in all those different ways and affordable as well? One of the first things they did, uh, the Cape did was uh, do the zero carbon study, which was trying to work out what the tipping point is between energy efficiency and affordability and how what is the best level of energy efficiency that can deliver real running cost savings throughout the life of the building and yet still be affordable. And the whole village is basically, in terms of the housing and the design guidelines are based on that initial zero carbon study. Um, in terms of planning too, it's quite unique. There's not many developments around that have more than 50% of the area of the site dedicated to public open space and parks and reserves. The street layout was crucial. The street layout and designing a, designing a suburb that can be sustainable, all the houses need to be able to have the appropriate orientation and all the streets are designed to provide all sites with great northern orientation. And within that, there's a network of public open space. So the connection with nature, I think, at the Cape is really unique. Every house has an incredible connection and there's this network of, of open space and paths. It's like a secondary network. You've got the streets, which are beautifully landscaped, and then you've got this secondary network of walkways and cycle paths and nature reserves. So everywhere you go there, you're connected. Even if you're not walking down the beach, which is incredibly close, <laughs> you're also very much a part of that coastal landscape. And the landscape quality, qualities, I think, are extraordinary because it's been all about preserving the uh, and really enhancing the biodiversity of the site. So getting the kangaroos back, which I believe they are in abundance now. Um, so providing a place, not just for humans, but for the, the native flora and fauna that, are, that live in that local area. Um, so that's how, that's how the landscaping works. And um, of course, in those early stages, there's been a lot of thought put into all the engineering that underneath the ground, it's a bit like an iceberg, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of thinking, a lot of engineering going on underground at the Cape to really get the reuse of storm water and all those sort of things happening. So, uh, so all, the, all the building blocks are in place to create a great sustainable community. I think at the start, uh, it was very much a design-led development. Uh, and, and I think it had a, it's the open source nature of the Cape as well that really sets it apart. So um, the developers thought ahead and decided to invest in some leading designers and architects to create home designs that were suited to the Cape, but could also be used all around Australia. And in fact, all around the world. Um, so that process led to more than 10 designs that are free and open source designs with everything about them, all the costing, plans, sections, elevations, and they can be downloaded off the Cape 
website. So I think that says a lot about this village. It's, not, it's about creating a beautiful, sustainable uh, village to live in for the people that live there. But it's, it's so much more than that. It's about showing Australia how you can build in the future. It's trying to say, it's, you, just, you can do this. If you follow our roadmap here, you can, you can actually do the same thing yourselves. And it's, and it's actually now achievable in terms of affordability. Thanks, Adam. Yeah. yeah. That, that's great, Adam. Yeah. So, so touching on that, um, building a model that's, uh, that proves that this is possible and that mm. other developers and other people can point to and, and emulate is a, is a really key part of what the case is trying to achieve. Um, we've got one question coming through, and for those people who couldn't quite hear me, I think I had some audio issues in the first few minutes. Um, there, please feel free to post your questions, which we'll get to um, over the course of the next 50 minutes uh, with all of our panelists. For example, one question's just come along that said, are dogs allowed at the Cape? And the answer is yes, uh, dogs are allowed at the Cape. And we have an off-leash dog park, uh, specially designed for them to run around and have a bit of fun. Uh, Next, uh, I'll talk with Tony. So Tony, you're considered a sustainable building expert. You, you speak uh, at various events and conferences on building, green building. Um, so where did your passion for building better, greener homes first develop and, and how did that evolve into what it is today? Yeah, thanks Clint. I, I guess I come up through a model of uh, working for a volume builder where budget was a key driver. Um, I went along to a a seminar presented by Brendan, actually presenting the idea of the Cape to the Cape Patterson community. I've lived here for 35 years. Um, and a few of the things that Brendan said on the day really touched a nerve and started to make a little bit of sense about why we should be doing things better and the legacy we're leaving for future generations. And it was really at that point that I started to explore the way that we as a company were building what we were doing and started to make some changes in the company and it's resulted in in quite a number of changes across not only our domestic but our, also our commercial projects. Um, we, we realised early on that there was no real big things that you could do to change a house individually. There's a whole sequence of small things that put together make a really great well-designed house and so if someone's looking for a magic bullet out there, it, it's not out there. There's just a whole heap of little things that we can do that when you put them together, you end up with a really great livable house. And I think that's the key. People are looking for the magic solution, but there's not. There's a whole heap of little things that we add together. Um, and we'll talk about some more of those a little bit later, but I think that's where we've evolved from. And every house that we build at the Cape is an evolution on the last house. Um, we learn things. Our trades are coming up with suggestions now, which is fantastic. They're engaging and they're coming and saying, why don't we do this? It's gonna make this a little bit better. And if we, we learn from those and we spread that knowledge amongst the other builders, we all talk as builders, um, we can help make the industry better as a whole. And I think that's really key. It's great to have the Cape as a, a localized project and as a, an example project. But if we can spread that knowledge out to the wider building community, and we've got some volume builders that are coming to Cape and are actually making changes to their standard designs based on what we've done. I think if we can get into those markets, we're, we're making some good goals. Brilliant, thanks, thanks Tony. Um, I particularly like being involved and in working with the builders down at the Cape because of what you talked about there, the, the cooperation, as we sometimes call it, where the builders are learning from each other. So every house has improved and the, the skill of each of the builders and the trades after each home improves, even when it wasn't one of their homes necessarily. So that's, uh, that's really good to see. Um, and now Michelle, just initially, I'd like to ask, I mean, your question, you've got a wealth of sustainability experience across a large number of industries um, and you've chosen to live at the Cape. So tell me a little bit about your home. Hi, Clint, and hi, everyone out there. Great to be here. Well, I guess we want to live the sustainable life that we've been advocating for years. So that's the short answer. Um, but the longer and probably more considered answer is, uh, firstly, custodianship, uh, connection, replication, affordability and system change. So there are a few, few different reasons there. And first of all, with custodians, I did want to acknowledge um, that we've moved from the city and the traditional lands of the Yalik Bullock clan, the Boon and the Boonarung um, peoples. And 
that uh, consideration of landscape and cultural heritage is actually really important here as we think about uh, building and human impact um, and really close to what is a pristine um, landscape. And rather than think of just offsetting or, or trying to balance out that impact, the opportunity here is to really make a positive contribution and restore. And so that was a big driver for us and really guided by that traditional owner um, thinking. And the connection, um, that really comes out through, uh, there's a Bunurung Aura Anifei Muir, and I want to say thank you to her because we decided to call our house Willamick. And it's not just a word that has a singular meaning, it's a, it's a conversation starter. And it means, this is our home, where do you live? And our home is, uh, you can see all the light coming in. I can look out to the front and I'm looking out to the street and I can see my neighbours going by. And I look out to the back, and we go out the door and we go out to the pathway network. And so within our home, we are not only connecting to the landscapes that Adam talked about, but we're connecting with our neighbours across Cape and everyone that comes to visit here. Of course, we can pull the blinds down for privacy, but what we're looking for is that connection. And isn't that um, really important at the moment as we've you know, been experiencing isolation across um, Australia and Victoria and Melbourne in particular. Um, replication, we've already talked about that, those open source design, it was something we could, we could take a design that was fit for purpose and tweak it, tweak it to the landscape in here, but by building, um, uh, you know, an 8.3 star home uh, for our family of four, you know, three bedrooms and, and, you know, all the features, we can show that this house could also be sit in other landscapes, so you don't have to necessarily be um, at the Cape. But that was the, the benefit of being here is that there was that thinking around how do we create these um, houses. And also importantly with that connection, it's the relationship between the houses as Adam and Tony have already um, touched on. So, uh, you know, to let in the Northern light and, and the warmth. And that's the kind of um, thinking that I think we need across Australia. So that relationship and connection between our homes, the landscape and people um, is really key. Affordability, we're really passionate about um, sustainable housing should be affordable housing and everyone should be able to experience the comfort that our family have had. Um, we don't have heating and cooling, we can add it in um, and, you know, and may need to as climate change exacerbates um, extreme temperatures, but we've been able to go at, for 12 months um, without any, um, uh, you know, um, any additional heating and cooling. So the design works and this is something that everyone should have, have access to. And regardless of the size, you know, we're looking at about $2,200 per square metre. This is something you can build, you can contract our design to put in a different landscape. And then systems change. So we were really attracted by the leadership of, of Tony of TS Constructions, of the designers. You know, there's more builders coming in here wanting to learn, be better. Um, so being able to be part of that and help shape that as residents is really, has been really terrific and has been it was a big driver for us coming down here. Thanks, Michelle. That's really good to hear. Um, I know that um, the beautiful 10 star house by the Sociable Weaver down there at the Cape um, theoretically needs no mechanical heating or cooling to stay at a comfortable uh, yes. temperature year round. But it's really good to hear that um, houses like yourself, when you're actively living in them, you know, opening up windows in the evening to flush out some of the warmer air, that you can still have a house uh, that's eight or even nine stars. Uh, and you can be comfortable year round without any heating, mechanical heating or cooling. So Absolutely. Really good to hear. Uh, we're having quite a few questions come in, so thank you everybody. I might direct the first question to Tony. Um, so it's about wall systems. We're not sure um, if, the question says, not sure if I should go reverse brick or, vene or veneer or insulated double bricks using air cell um, permacav XB. Which one provides the best performance for the money? Thank you, Tony. Yeah, look, from, from my experience, I prefer the reverse brick system. Uh, it lets us, we use a multiple system where we have not only the, the insulated frame, but we also batten to get a further air pocket. And we find with the reverse brick system, it offers not only a really high insulation value, but from constructability with double brick, you just lose time building the brickwork and having other trades involved. With, with the reverse brick, you can put a frame up get your roof structure on fairly quickly. And it's particularly important if you're in, in an environment that gets uh, wind and rain, um, it helps the construction time period. 
from a pricing point of view, the reverse bricks probably slightly cheaper to build as well. They're both very comparable in pricing, but I think you probably get a better thermal effect too. And you can get that insulation. You can double up on your cavity through the, uh, the reverse brick. Great, thanks for that, Tony. We've got another one here, uh, which I might direct to Adam. Uh, and Adam, you're on mute at the moment. It says, hello, with the vegetation at the Cape, is there an optimum height and density, or is it simply that more is better? Just asking, is curious to know how tree heights work with natural light, solar panels, etc. Thanks, from Tom. Uh, thank you, Tom, for that question. Uh, it's a good question because height of vegetation is very important for obviously our solar panels need sunlight but so too do our backyards our gardens and our living areas so um, all that is factored into we have a set of design guidelines which look at planting heights and it's like it's quite we've we've kind of worked it out and the winter sun is key to everything in terms of energy efficiency and livability at the Cape, I think. Access to sun is one of the key things that underlines everything, all the thinking behind the Cape. There's a lot of other thinking about social connections as Michelle was talking about, but really the sun is your friend at the Cape and the landscaping is all set up to achieve that. Brilliant, that's right. And, and there is a, there's an owner's corporation that operates with maintenance people. So um, if, uh, trees become too high in, in common property, they can be trimmed down if they're going to um, interrupt people's winter sun. Um, so this one's probably a good one for Michelle. We've got one from Dyer, which says, how many changes to the building's design are residents or purchasers encountering between purchasing off the plan and walking into the final actuality? Uh, well, it, look, it will vary, but I think it, it depends. There, there were some those ten off um, open source plans um, that Adam mentioned, and we were able to work with uh, TS Constructions and local de designer um, Beaumont to to tweak that to this um, place. So there was a, a bit of back and forward um, on that, um, but really it was you know, that, that design um, was going to work for this site. And what we've been seeing, we bought land here about four years ago and moved, as we said, early last year, and we're seeing more houses um, being built. And both the designers, the builders, and also residents and future residents learning from the designs that are currently available. So there is tweaking to fit for purpose, um, but I, I think it's a pretty streamlined um, process because we can see, um, you know, what's going to work. Um, and I guess there is, I, I did feel that there is a, you know, good conversation and openness to be able to talk about, um, you know, about design um, and about um, the community more broadly. Um, residents certainly have input into that. So I don't know if that answers your question quickly, but I think it's pretty streamlined, um, but there's an opportunity to shape not only your own house, but also be part of the, um, the broader development down here, which is great. Yeah, that's great, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, there's another one that, that's a technical one, which I might direct to Tony. And Andrew asks, has there been testing of houses post-construction to ensure they meet the design energy efficiency standards? Um, and Tony, you're familiar with the RMIT study, so perhaps you want to um, mention about that. Yeah, look, thanks, Clint. Um, there's been a number of houses, I believe it's six or seven, that have been connected up to monitors for over 12 months. They have internal monitors, external monitors. And the monitors are both in... Uh, living areas and bedroom areas and they've been testing to see if the how, how the house performs in relation to how they should compare to their energy rating and they're finding that the houses are actually performing better than what the energy rating says that they will which is a really great positive to see that the houses are performing you know in some cases quite a bit better than anticipated um, not only that, Cape's taken a bit of a leadership role in the little things like we've introduced blower door testing as a, a post-construction uh, item that to demonstrate that the houses are being built to a level as good or better than what, what they should be. I think that's a really positive step as well. And I'll post that uh, link to that study.
Funny, what about um, blood oil testing or, or looking for draft fruit and the sorts of things that UNTS Construction do for home of the case? How does that help prove uh, the performance of the house and make sure that it can be um, confidently going to cover you without that happening? Uh, sorry, Clint, I, your audio has gone really faint again. I think there was a question about blow door testing and, and what we're doing. Um, we've found that since we did our initial blow door test, we've been able to get our results significantly better because each time we do a test, we get all the subcontractors on site and not only our own subcontractors, but if any other builders are on site, we bring them in. Uh, we bring in local architects and draftsmen to have a look at the blow door test and how it actually works, because I think it's important to demonstrate to people why we do these things. Um, a blower door test identifies any air leakage in the house, and it gives you the opportunity, not only on that house to fix it, but on future houses, you know where to start looking before you even get your test done. So we've seen since we started our blower door test, our results have come down significantly in the number of air changes an hour, um, to the point where they're almost as tight as we want them to be. Um, you still need some fresh air into a house, um, but we've found that yeah, the results are coming down and, and part of that is builder-led and part of it's subcontractor-led. Some of our subcontractors now are getting a little bit competitive. They don't want to be the one that when, you know, there's plumbers, electricians and draftsmen in a house or architects in a house, they don't want to be the one that everyone's pointing a finger at saying, this house has got a poor result because of you. So it's really great, that bit of competition between the trades and it's proving and giving a result that for clients is fantastic down the track as far as ongoing power bills. The heating and cooling, because that air loss, particularly in winter, that air loss is hot air going out of the house. So if we can prevent that, um, the house's natural warmth is going to be retained within the house. Sorry, Clint. Yeah, it's still coming through uh, a little um, rough there. Just double checking uh, the microphone you're using. Is that just the onboard microphone on the device or? It, it, had, it was one of the best of testing this morning. Uh, I might, I'll just go to Adam to answer a question if people can hear me. And uh, I'll go and see what I can do about it. The question's from Raphael. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, thinking about floor plans, given the equipment required to go all electric, heat pump, converter, batteries, TV, charger, etc., would you recommend that a garage has now become a must have to protect those devices? Sorry, Clint, I couldn't hear that. There was something about garages. Uh, it was about protecting devices. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, sorry. Can you say that again, Michelle? I'm uh, just uh, have a garage structure to protect uh, devices. Oh, a garage structure to... Protect uh, devices such as your solar infrastructure and monitoring. And oh, right. Um, yeah, so, well, I just... Uh, my, so, basically, the solar device, the, uh, I suppose, sustainable infrastructure that you have, a lot of it is suitable for being outside. It doesn't necessarily have to be in the garage. Uh, but it's certainly helpful to have it in the garage because that does increase its longevity. Am I right there? I think Tony, like the, uh, you might want to talk about this one. Yeah, no, look, definitely some of the equipment's better off being placed in, in the garage or in weatherproof areas. Some of the equipment, our heat pumps, for example, uh, we find that they work very efficiently outside. They need that ventilation area around them. Um, as far as, and the question asks, would you recommend the garage has now become a must have to protect the devices? It's certainly advantageous in the coastal environment that we live in. Um, if we we're further inland, I'd say it's probably questionable. But here, things like your batteries and that, I think it's good to have them in a garage purely because we've got so much salt air, which brings about corrosion of that in our environment. We're only a few hundred metres from breaking surf. And so we have to take that into consideration. Um, if you're further inland, you can probably get away without it. Um, but as I said, we're, we are very close to the sea where we are. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Uh, can, does the audio work a bit better now, hopefully? 
That, that is a bit better. Right. Thanks, Clint. We're back on. Okay. Uh, Michelle, here's one for you. It's from Nick. And, and Nick asks, what range of temperatures does your house go through, winter to summer? Thanks, Nick. Um, so we're just coming out of uh, winter and we're certainly getting um, warmer temperatures already outside. Um, but internally, we're, we're staying between about 15 and um, 22. Um, so even at night, um, we have like most, most homes here, uh, we've got the polished con concrete floor, um, we've got some you know, lovely um, thermal mass there in the recycled brick at, um, with our north facing um, aspect. And so we are holding that beautiful um, warmth um, in our floor and throughout the home um, during winter. Um, so that's why I said we haven't had needed any uh, mechanical heating um, or indeed cooling we, we found in summer and it was our first summer um, worked the same on so on some of those extreme days you know heading up towards 40 and we were still sitting around 22 23 which was really extraordinary and we know in broader cape some you know the power was going out and we had um, beat shacks that were people were in um, real trouble so I sort of started a little project around this being a a place of resilience where people could come to feel um, safe and healthy during summer. So that's been our experience to date. And there has, as Tony mentioned, been tracking of all of the houses and we're seeing um, really that consistency throughout the year, which is about comfort and basically a human right, which is why I think everyone should have access to these type of homes. Great, thanks, Michelle. And don't run away. Um, I've got another question here for you. Uh, and that is how much noise, this come from, comes from Helen, how much noise transmission is there across home sites? Vehicle, human, music, dogs, how much interior noise transmission between rooms? And you might draw a parallel or a comparison between other homes you've built in or lived in elsewhere. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, look, well, I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old, so um, I am very aware of, um, <laughs> of, of sound, um, uh, both my piece and quiet and, and theirs. Um, we, we have double glazed um, windows and doors. We have uh, insulated walls, which, you know, obviously keeps in the heat and, when, and, and um, sorry, keeps in the warmth um, and also insulates during summer. And um, we talked about the air changes, you know, TS Constructions did an, um, a blower test for us and um, it, it proved the experience that we're living. But of course, with all of those features that keep us comfortable, that also blocks out sound. And so we've got this lovely um, young couple across the road that are musicians and they're like, oh, I'm sorry if you can hear our music. And I've said, well, no, you really need to come out to the street because we can't. Um, so that's why for us also the, the windows and the visibility are really important because our houses are well insulated um, from sound. And so, you know, being out able to open up your window during the night and hear the ocean is really beautiful. But when it's closed, um, it's just us. And we have a very open plan design and we did that um, because we've got young kids and we might compartmentalise um, sections um, to date. But we have beautiful sliding doors um, that close off different areas and yeah, it's very comfortable. So it works, but it comes down to those basic principles of insulating the walls, the floors and having those double glazed windows and that provides the sound protection if that's what you're looking for. And I note um, with your uh, microphone there and your internet connection that you've, you've got NBN unlike uh, myself in, in Melbourne here where it's <laughs> a bit lacklustre. Um, there's quite a few questions coming in now about passive house certification. So we might talk to a couple of those. Just to, just to answer one from FNB Architects uh, who ask, are there any houses going for passive house certification? The answer is yes. There's, um, we've recently had one completed which is built to passive house principles and there's one that is uh, nearly completed and that will be a certified passive house. Um, I might direct the next question though from Tegan to Adam. Adam, what ability do residents have to assist in revegetation works or designing or altering veggie gardens, et cetera? Uh, thanks, Clint and uh, Tegan. So, uh, well, firstly, in terms of veggie gardens, the Cape has a fantastic community vegetable garden, which is run by the community. It's growing as we speak, and it's soon to have uh, some uh, a community building attached to it as well. So, at the Cape, growing veggies is very much part of the lifestyle that uh, we're trying to support. So. Veggies can be grown in your own property, in your own backyard, but you can also 
use the community garden and um, and really get your hands dirty growing all sorts of things and having cookups down at the community veggie garden. So I'm not sure whether that answers the question, but it's very much part of living at the Cape, I think, as I'm sure Definitely. Michelle could uh, attest to. And we've had a pilot uh, community farm uh, with dozens of gardeners down there for a few years now. We're about to start building the one of the biggest community farms uh, in Australia later this year. Um, so it'll have room for uh, hundreds of gardeners. Um, it'd be a really, really great place to hang out because it's, it's the central hub of the community. Um, a question that's coming here is, uh, does the development attempt to create some common rules? Uh, for example, electric only, no fossil fuels. I might direct that one to Tony. Uh, thanks, Clip. Um, yeah, we have a number of um, things in, in place uh, I guess to ensure the standard of the houses at the Cape. And we're finding these have been particularly successful, so successful in fact that they've been adopted by a number of other states Australia-wide, which is really great. So we have like design guidelines in place um, about what you can and can't do that require certain things uh, like um, electric vehicle charge points in the garages. So we're not saying you have to have an electric vehicle, but we're putting provision in, and we've already got several residents that have them. We're putting the provision in so that in the future, you can charge your car without having to make expensive alterations. We have things in place like um, you know, solar requirements. So it's a minimum of two and a half kilowatts. We're finding the average that goes in across the state's about five kilowatts, typically across the houses so far. Um, and then on top of that, we have um, some model rules. Um, and I can't think of the name of what I'm after, but we have a group that organise around the Cape. So we have, do have some model rules in at the Cape. Great. And um, the, there's a question here that's coming from Devon. Uh, what sort of cost would be would be realistically looking for a small family home from start to finish at the Cape? Um, so I might give that to Tony, but I will say that the land price, the, the lots that we've sold this year, they kind of range from about 180 up to 400. But in terms of the build cost, Tony, what would you say there? What sort of a range should people be looking at? Uh, look, at the Cape so far across the builds where our houses are ranging from around probably 320 to 350 up to about 500. So it depends on what you consider to be a small family home because some people are small family homes, three bedrooms, a rumpus and a living room, other people it's not. So it, in that range of 350 to 500 has been fairly commonly where we've been placed. Some homes have been a little bit more, some homes have been a little bit less. It really depends what you're looking for in terms of the house. All of the homes on the, the 10 standard houses fit within that range. Um, I would say, and as Michelle said earlier, modifications to those plans are something that we actually encourage because as an owner, people know how they want to live in a house. I think it's important that we can make those changes and flexibility, still keeping the house very, the passive solar principles in the house. We need to be aware that, you know, sometimes small changes have a big impact on our, our energy usage. Uh, so we, we need to be careful about that. Um, yeah, no, there's definitely a range there. About 350 to 500 is probably the typical. Just depends what you're looking for as a small house. That's right. It sounds it's very, um, very um, much determined by the size of the house. We've got a, a small house or a tiny house on site, and that falls, you know, the construction cost is below that range, um, and there can be ones above that range. Before you go, Tony, I've got one question here. And we're getting questions through quite a rate at the moment. Um, we'll answer as many as we can. Uh, with the panelists right now, but any ones that we can't get to, we'll get to over by writing a response in the time after the session finishes at 11. Uh, the question is, what are the air changes per hour that you're achieving at 50 pascals in your blow-door tests? So, so typically we're, we're aiming uh, to get our houses in the range of four to five air changes. Um, we believe, we don't put uh, heat recovery systems into our houses at this point because we believe that that four to five, uh, there's enough fresh air movement in the houses not to require it. If we were going any tighter than that, I think we'd definitely go to a HRV system. Um, typically the standard around Victoria and Australia is probably up in the 20s 
as a air changer. So we're, we're significantly below that. We're sitting comparable with a number of European countries at that four to five. So we, we think that's a pretty good benchmark. Great, thank you. Now the next question I might split up into two parts. It comes from Claire who says, I'm building in the lower Blue Mountains, New South Wales and have taken as much as I think possible from the Cape, bearing in mind there will be limits on tree removal, et cetera. Can you go through all the little things that add up so I can maximize my energy efficiency? We luckily have land that is facing north and mild weather. So I might firstly go to Adam um, and, and can you add up the little things that, uh, that Claire can look at to maximise the energy efficiency? And then I might come to Michelle to uh, talk about the little things that you find have been really beneficial in your house when you designed and, and built that. So Adam, first of all. Thanks, Clint. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, it's building on what Tony said earlier, it's, there's no silver bullet. Uh, it's very true for sustainability. So I think the key little things and each one of them becomes more, you know, the part, the, the sum of these parts becomes more than you can, you know, it all adds up to be more. But, uh, you know, passive design is just absolutely fundamental to a house design. So facing north, having thermal mass and all these things would, um, would relate to uh, the Blue Mountains because it's a similar, it's a different, slightly different climate zone to the Cape, but it's still temperate. Um, allowing for cross flow ventilation and really fine tuning the house, getting an understanding of your own site and fine tuning it for prevailing winds and where the weather comes from. Really important for minimizing your energy use and really also just as importantly, in maximizing the comfort and livability of the home. Um, so I think they're the key things, orientation, facing north, getting thermal mass, allowing for, allowing to be able to open up the house and, and take advantage of prevailing breezes and really focusing on your local climate as much as you can. You can borrow ideas from other places, but in the end, the house has to sit well with your own microclimate. Thank you. And Michelle, what are the parts of the house, of your house at the Cape do you find the, the little features that are really useful and you're really glad they've been added on? Well, there's a lot, a lot of little features that all add up to, um, to make a really comfortable home. I mentioned it's got a big feature that our open living area, so it includes a kitchen, dining, where we, we gather, play, uh, that's all polished concrete floor and, and having that warmth under your feet in the middle of winter is, um, is a pretty terrific feature. Um, having all electric appliances, so going back to those, I guess, model rules, yes, this is an all electric state. There's no reason to have gas here. Um, and I also think we can retrofit to, to have no gas, but this is about building new and those electric appliances mean we can run things off the solar. So again, little thing, but actually a big thing because now we're zeroing out on our bills. We don't have any, any bills. So that's pretty important. Um, so definitely go for all electric um, if you can. Um, and I guess, you know, I mentioned the double glazing, all of those features that I think are really, um, uh, you know, really important and of course we're living in the home so we're tweaking and I've got a five-year-old and a one-year-old so we're con continually thinking about we've all got different thermal comfort so you know working with the home and knowing that you know we've used um, natural timbers and recycled timbers they move so we're going to have to keep tweaking to make sure we get um, we keep out some of the cool air and, and hot air in summer and things like that. So it's about working with your building, but we've had a very good start and very strong foundations, which means that, you know, we're living in comfort. Great. Thanks, Michelle. We've got a couple of questions coming through about uh, heat uh, exchange, air exchange components to regulate fresh air into the houses and other ones about air changes per minute. So quite a bit of interest there. Um, the CAPES introduced a standard where we have no more than seven air changes uh, per hour uh, and Tony touched on before that the homes that they build are usually in the range of four to five which is a, is, is a safe um, sort of range where there's enough fresh air um, to keep everyone happy and healthy and it avoids the need for any uh, mechanical heat exchange uh, equipment but we do have passive houses with that equipment at the Cape. Uh, Tony there's a question from Carly here and she asks what are the benefits of highlight windows and are there any pitfalls or things to be aware of when integrating into your design? Yeah, look, uh, highlight windows, and we've got quite a few houses. And I, look, I've just turned around, I've got, um, 
I've got some windows in the uh, display I'm in at the moment, the, the nine star house that I'm in at the moment. Um, the, the great thing about them is, and the house I'm in at the moment I'll talk to, we get that sun over winter. So we've set them in our weave lawn so we get sun streaming in, in winter and running right through the house. Um, we've also got them shaded so that in summer they don't get sun in. And so at the moment we're getting sun streaming through the north windows and heating our concrete as thermal mass. But in summer, if you came into this house, um, the middle of January, the sun doesn't actually hit the concrete at all. And that's the biggest danger. People put in high light windows through the house and don't think about shading on it. And while it's great in winter, they get this really high heat effect in summer. Um, the other thing about high light windows that we I love in this house is we've got low windows on the south and we get predominantly sea breezes from the southwest here. We've got our high windows that are openable on the north with raking ceilings. And what we can do is we can then flush the house in, in summer so we don't need that air conditioning. So we get that cool breeze coming in low in the south and rising up through the house as it heats and out through the windows and it purges the house of hot air in, in summer. And so it acts as a natural air conditioner. But the, the biggest risk with the high light windows is not having the shading correct. And if you've got windows above other windows, we sometimes put a big eave out over the high lights, but we don't consider the lower windows. So it's a two part thing there. We need to really think about that shading. Uh, otherwise we're gonna give ourselves issue in summer, but there's a number of advantages in having them. And they can look great. So there's that as well. Uh, there's a question here for Adam. Uh, from Pat and Ray. So there's, it's a simple question. Does placing rugs on the concrete floors affect the ability to heat and cool? Uh, thank you for that question, Clint. Yes, it does. Um, so thermal mass needs to, you need to have air touching the thermal mass. So if you've got a polished concrete slab, um, to get the thermal benefit of that concrete slab, you need to have air touching it. Um, having said that, rugs are fine. It's just, uh, you know, the way you would normally position rugs in a polished floorboard home, for example, or a polished concrete home is fine. A rug under the, the coffee table and a rug under the couch and, you know, that sort of thing is fine. It just, but you just can't, um, you can have, there is such a thing as too many rugs <laughs> uh, to achieve your sustainability goals. Great. Uh, and while we've got you, Adam, from Sue, she asks, with regard to wall insulation, how can I easily increase the R value to the standard R2.4 in walls without increasing the cavity width? Uh, well, there's, there's insulation bats already that um, are like R2.7, the super high density bats. So you can achieve, you can put R2.7 bats in a standard 90, uh, 90 millimeter stud wall without a problem. So we would recommend that. And then also, uh, it's not just about the insulation, it's about the breathability. So I would fully, really highly recommend a, a, a very breathable wall wrap, not the silver or blue paper that you see on a lot of houses, but actually, because as buildings get more and more energy efficient, um, they need to breathe more as well. Great. And Michelle, there's, there's probably a couple here for you. Firstly, from Paul, uh, how often do you have the house open compared to the time that you're using the sealed unit that uses the HPV? So, uh, so how, sorry, I'm, maybe I don't quite understand the question. But. I think it's how often do you have the house yeah. opened up yeah. with all of the windows? So yes, it's yeah. probably climate related. Yes, yeah. Um, well, I guess, um, uh, particularly in summer, um, so we, we certainly want to flush out, um, any, any warm air that's, that's come in. Um, you know, I've mentioned again, we have young children, so we build a house, we've got the foundations right, we've got the best design, and then it's a behavior can also influence the way the house performs. So, um, close it, continually closing the doors is important. So I guess in winter, um, we keep the house quite, um, uh, quite tight because we don't want that cool air um, to come in. And, um, and that means we haven't had to put in heating. Um, during summer at night, um, we get the beautiful sea breeze. So I guess we're again, working with our environment and, and you know, 
flush any hot air that's come in during the day with the kids running in and out. Um, so it, yeah, it depends on the season, I think is the, the point. I tend to keep it quite, quite tight um, during, um, during the winter months. Great. And I, I might reword Juliet's question here, but she asks about in relation to air changes, um, mm -hmm. could it be a problem unless you've got a very non-toxic house with um, glues, adhesives, paints, that type of stuff? And what have you done to consider that, Michelle? Especially yeah, that's a great question. And we, when, you know, when we were looking at our house, um, I think our, our joiners, our lovely local joiners asked us about colours for our kitchen and we said formaldehyde. You know, we really wanted to think about those materials, especially having, you know, had a six month old baby at the time. Um, you know, they're particularly sensitive. I think, um, you know, the builders now have standard, you know, no VOC paints. And so all of those features are um, I, I guess standard as part of these houses and, and recognised to be um, just part of a sustainable house. Um, and the materials we were able to go on a bit of a journey to understand um, what, was, what was put in and to understand the cost differentiation. Um, so we've got lots of natural timbers and, and woods and, um, and so I think, you know, and natural, natural carpets. And so a lot of those things were considered, but in an affordable lens. And we did that for ourselves, but also to be able to, um, Say to others, you know, we don't have to necessarily have a cost premium um, in thinking about those materials. And yes, certainly, if you don't have those no to low VOC products, then um, it can be an impact if you're if you're not opening up your home. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here from Kim who asks: Are the blocks designed with orientation and privacy in mind? And how do you do that with smaller blocks? Uh, so we talked a little bit about the uh, arrangement of the lots at the start of the presentation, but there's, there's a wide variety of blocks. Um, some obviously facing uh, north, south, east or west to the street um, and all connected with a, a network of walking paths so you can get to open spaces, uh, community, farm, ocean and friends houses quite easily. Uh, so if you prefer um, a certain type of, of home with privacy, there's, there's options there. People are asking about um, the, the type of lots at the Cape too. Um, if you head to our website, liveatthecape.com.au, you can see the arrangement of the available lots there. Um, and the next stage um, is likely to happen later this year to answer that question too. Uh, so we've got one here. Uh, is temperature control typically passive or do they require manual open and closing of curtains, shutters and windows? Uh, Tony, you might answer this one looking typically across the whole site? Yeah, look, temperature control definitely is enhanced by having, you know, like in Michelle's case, an owner in residence. Um, we have our, our display house here that we don't have curtains on. Um, and the temperature in this house definitely fluctuates more than a house that is lived in. Um, the houses, particularly over winter, um, a house that has someone in there cooking, showering, where all those things give off a little bit of heat and that's absorbed into the house, um, the temperature is much more stable than in a house that you shut up for five days of the week and there's no one here. Um, the houses are designed to the point where we had a meeting in this house, we had five people in here for an hour in the middle of winter and the house core temperature rose by a degree and a half just with the body heat coming off people and it retained that house for several hours. Um, so that sort of effect, um, the world is on with the thermal mass, but it definitely is enhanced by having a resident that can control you. Know, if things are starting to get a little bit warm and you can open that highlight north window to flush the air out over summer, you then don't need to turn your air conditioner on. You can keep your temperature a little bit more stable. Whereas if the house is you know, locked up and no one's in residence, you don't have that opportunity. Great. And, um so we, we talk quite a bit about um, passive solar design and, and mainstreaming that affordable, sustainable house that has very low running costs um, and net zero carbon. There's a question here from Mike, and he says that you've been talking about polished concrete floors. Do you insulate the total slab? There might be one for you again, Tony. Yeah, look, we, we insulate the, the total of the underneath of the slab at the moment with the new design that we're using. We don't insulate around the perimeter of the slab. And that's from past experience we've found that we don't have a, a good system that's robust enough to give long life. Uh, typically the systems that go around the outside of the slab over the years, 
they absorb a lot of moisture, they become soft. Someone goes around with a brush cutter cleaning weeds up and they cut through the systems and, and ruin their effectiveness. So we insulate under the slab, but not around the perimeter because we just haven't been able to find that system yet that's going to give us the durability. It's great in the initial stages, but we want something that's performing 10 or 20 years down the track, not just something that's performing when we hand the house over. Yeah, yeah, great point there, Tony. Uh, we've got one here for Adam from Devon. Have potential bushfires been taken into consideration uh, in the community planning? And do the houses at the Cape have any bushfire protection features? Uh, thanks, Clint. Yes, uh, bushfire planning has been central to uh, actually getting development approval. So there is a bushfire management plan, which um, has been approved by the CFA and Basco Shire, which covers the entire village. Um, so it's an all of village approach to bushfire protection. And so as a part of that, most of the houses have a bowel rating, a bushfire attack level of 12.5. There are some lots where they get closer to the primary dune. So the closer the beach you go, the higher your bushfire attack level. Um, but, but yes, there's a bushfire attack, ma uh, a bushfire management plan that all the vegetation on the village and all the landscaping and all the design has been based on, including some houses needing to have water tanks specifically for the CFA use. So it's been really well considered. It, all the timing of the design has come with recent uh, or those bushfire events at the time informing the process. Great. Um, thanks for that. There's a couple more questions coming here. Michelle, you might answer this one. Does anyone use underfloor heating through this lab for winter heating? Anyone at all? Michelle, I think you're on mute there too. You're just on mute there, Michelle. Tony's saying no, so I might go with Tony because um, I, yeah, I don't think anyone is at, at the moment. There are some different, um, again, I talked about thermal comfort, there's different needs. Uh, we've got some of our um, residents you know, identify as older and, and you know, they want the warmth and so they've got different um, heating, uh, but no, no underfloor at this stage. Um, so no underfloor um, and Tony, you might talk to you, you've built quite a few homes down there and worked with a lot of the uh, purchasers. There's no any, any slab heating and is there a requirement for any of that sort of heating or the efficient um, heat pump air conditioners? Yeah, look, generally the, the feedback I've had from residents, we've had residents that have been on occupation now for a couple of years, so it, it's getting that good long-term feedback. Um, generally, residents actually in winter are surprised. They walk outside in a T-shirt and mm. have to go back inside to put a jumper on. The houses hold their temperature really, really well. Uh, haven't had anyone ask about retrofitting heating into a house yet, so I guess that's you know, proofs in the, the delivery there. Right. Lint, uh, this is Damien here. We, we might have to wrap up this session. This has been fantastic, but uh, we're going to have to move to our next one. Thanks, Damien. Thank you to everybody for tuning in. Thank you, all of the panellists. Uh, we will endeavour to answer all of the questions. There's another 70 there to answer over the next few hours. Uh, there's more information at liveatthecape.com.au. So feel free to reach out to us and um, good luck with your sustainable house journey. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Clint, and uh, thank you to all the panellists. That was fantastic. It's great to see the Cape, uh, how it's evolved. The Renew's been involved with the project for over 10 years, and it's just it's an amazing evolution of that project and one to definitely uh, watch and keep in touch with. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, as you know, we're running three different rooms today, um, so there's plenty of homes and, and uh, panel sessions to have a look at. We're also running extension sessions outside of today, so during this week, uh, generally in the evening times, we're running uh, information sessions for people on different topics. So go to the Sustainable House Day website to have a look for the details on those.